Well, thank you very much. Um, I must say that I'm particularly grateful to the program committee because uh, they allowed me to speak about a topic that uh, is quite new for me, but I had this in mind for many, many years, and it has always been part of my, let's say, way to be a doctor. Um, I also have to apologize, probably, because when I speak about technical things, I can be very precise, and my English is probably better. When I start to speak about uh, a little bit uh, different discipline, um, the nuances of the language may be lost in transition a little bit. I'm sure in Italian I would give a better talk, probably. Anyway, um, there is something that is often missing in the spirit of a doctor, and it is the concept that we perceive reality with different senses. You know, also I think any one of us is probably uh, interested and uh, moved by a specific feeling uh, about reality. And for me, beauty and wellness are part of the life of the individual. Just to make an example, yesterday, when we entered the Olympic Theater, and I saw in front of the Olympic Theater, which is a jewel, the writing on the wall by some idiots. I just had the idea to kill somebody. I, I don't know how somebody can be so stupid. Um, but I have seen the mayor of the city walking through that and not even noting that. If I was the mayor of the city, I would have canceled this immediately. So I think that any one of us has probably a different perception. But being doctors means to have your own perception and also take care of the perception of your patients. So it's interesting that uh, the keywords of our meeting today include the concept of well-being as a general concept and uh, symmetry and balance represent uh, some of the aspects related to architecture. Again, I apologize with the architects uh, about uh, probably I'm going to be very rude in my description. Symmetry normally provides balance, but balance is much more than symmetry. And it is interesting that uh, we had good example in nature, the human body, which is a fantastic example of symmetry. However, if you look this in a 3D version, you see that inside we are much more than symmetry. We have a specific balance, the liver, uh, the spleen, the heart itself, they are not organs that are symmetric in the body, but they have a fantastic balance. It has been shown that even 10 to 20 grams difference in one side of your body can affect your spine and your perfect standing in the long run. 10 to 20 grams. Can you imagine how much balance has counted in the overall configuration of the body, and it's just a fantastic structure if you just think about this. But there is more about that. Uh, uh, somehow the human body can be compared to the front of the Palladian system, where you have the columns and you have, I don't even know how you call the, in architecture, the triangle. In Latin we call tympanus, but uh, probably it's something similar. Anyway. This includes the approach that divides the world into immanence and transcendence. And just to make uh, clear what I mean, our body resembles the front of a temple in which we have a square 
that represent the earth, the season, the elements, the cardinal points, they are all four, like the corners of the square. While the triangle here represents the trinity, some theological virtues. And we can figure out this to be ethics versus aesthetics. So we have an interesting concept of the semantic triangle that includes the concept, the object, and sign. And uh, we use Bayesian learning to better understand everything in nature, including disease. This is the way we learn how to do diagnosis from our mistakes and from events that are probable to occur based on a previous knowledge. So in this case, for example, the triangle includes the physician, the disease, and sign and symptoms. I'm sure that uh, this triangle can be applied in architecture when you may have the sign, the meaning, and the object. And at the end, our approach to diagnosis is somehow similar to the approach of creation of a building. Uh, I hope I'm not going too far away, but uh, believe me, I spend a lot of time thinking and uh, our disciplines are not so distant. We are employing the same kind of process. So the architect, the ideas and construction and the building probably provides the final results. And this is true perception, association, and experience. Now, I would like to mention, these are two books we publish in the Humanistic School of Medicine in our uh, department. One is Ethics and Medicine, and the other is Aesthetics and Medicine. So we have Heaven and Earth. We have Aesthetics as part of our approach to the patient. Nothing to do with aesthetic medicine in general. This is a, to an, an extent of the application of aesthetics. But where is the concept of aesthetics coming from? The term in Greek, and I'm sorry, I did five years of ancient Greek, so I can speak with some knowledge about this. Aesthesis means perception. So this is very interesting because you perceive things. And uh, synesthesia is a term that means with aesthesis. In a less literal translation, it is a blend of perceptions. So I think that uh, this is a very interesting thing because if we consider this aspect, we might Imagine that sight, hearing, touch, smell, taste all participate to our perception. I was particularly interested in the first speech about the sensory experience of a, of a garden. It's exactly the same thing. We're talking about the same thing. So synesthesia. You might have heard about the concept of hearing colors, seeing sounds, can you imagine to use another sense to perceive something that was designed to be perceived by another sense? And we have to apply this for our patients, but also for our doctors and nurses, because synesthesia represents an approach to life in the interaction between doctors, nurses, and patients. When somebody goes to the hospital, this is a horrible, horrible sensory experience. And it's not easy for the senses. Many heart sensations impact people that are there. Not only patients, bad smells, loud sounds, scary sights. These contribute to a stressful experience. So let's talk about sights. Very often we have flash fluorescent hallways, lighting, and flashing lights outside rooms where 
Fall risk patients stand up from their bed, for example, and these are the site equivalent of noise in terms of staff stress and alarm fatigue. The color palette is mostly beige. Oh, horrible. With some other pastel tones, often not very well uh, matched. Start decor, basic furniture, various machines comprise the basic in-room experience. Artificial, sterile environment opposite to the garden that we would like to have. Hearing. Well, this is an interesting thing because I wrote years ago a paper on acoustic pollution in the hospital. Probably uh, is something inside me, but when I hear two nurses speaking loudly in the hallway, I imagine the patient feeling bad and hearing this disturbing noise. But the same is true when you have a trolley that goes <laughs> when a little bit of oil in the wheels will resolve the problem. All these things, I think, uh, are terrible. But you have to know that noise pollution in hospital can be substantial. In some cases, it can be at a very, very high level. Uh, we specifically studied the noise pollution in the hemodialysis centers and also in the intensive care, where you have alarms, machines blinking, uh, you have noise from blood pumps, and this is what is needed. But then you have other noises that are not needed and only depend on very poor maintenance of the, uh, the system. In some other cases, uh, uh, you have communication between staff that may be very noisy or maybe people that keep TV uh, at a very high level and uh, in some cases, beepers, telephone conversation. Have you never noted in the train, sometimes when you speak on the phone and nobody else hears you and there are people that speak so loud that you somehow participate in their business and so on. It's incredible. And this is part of the education of the person. You have to educate your nurses, your doctors. You have to tell people that this is important. So alarms and beeps, especially in intensive care, we have an enormous number of alarms. And this brings to a concept of alarm fatigue. At the end, we are so used to hear alarms that we don't pay attention to them. But what is the sensory experience of a, of a patient that is feeling a lot of uncertainty? If the machine I'm attached on is alarming, something wrong may be occurring. So I think that this is a, a, a reason why a, a bedside alarm uh, uh, represents a problem, but also noise from other patients uh, especially when you have rooms that uh, include more than one patient and uh, the noise of the staff should be also uh, taken care. What about touch? Well, tactile sensations, I think it's important because patient lying in bed with a standard lightweight blanket and she hooked up to an IV line and fluid drainage tubes inserted in the body, they may not feel very well. And sometimes they are in different kind of pain. The rooms sometimes are ventilated, but uh, the air feels still. There's no fresh air allowed. The windows don't open in many hospitals. I remember my first experience in the old Mount Sinai Hospital, where they had the air conditioning attached in winter to counterbalance the excessive heat provided by the heating system. This is nonsense. Uh, and I think that uh, the other problem that patients may have is the lack of meaningful contact with other people, like uh, the hugs and the handshaking that we normally have in our general life. So all these aspects, lean and pillows, and everything that comes in contact to your body may affect your state of well-being while you are in the hospital. Not to forget temperature, which is a tactile sensation 
And uh, remember, low temperature leads to vasoconstriction and shivering, while high temperature, vasodilatation, in some cases even shock. <coughs> Smell. Mm. When you enter the uh, hospital zone, very often you have uh, a classic uh, antiseptic uh, smell. Um, patient uh, may have uh, a bad feeling about uh, other aspects related to the normal, let's say, care that we take about uh, patients, especially when patients have infection, drainage, or uh, they have a special uh, 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 disease. What causes hospital smell? Well, there are different things. Uh, one thing can be simply the disinfection that we make, but the other thing can be uh, coming from uh, uh, patients' uh, care, uh, disinfectants. Uh, is something that is really assaulting your sense of smell and patient's sense of smell. I think we have to try to get rid of the odor and try to make it better for the patient and for the people who live there. And in fact, uh, there are aspects related specifically to cancer centers that are trying to uh, take care of this uh, specific aspect. Taste. This seems quite strange, but in reality, very often, hospital food is horrible. Uh, why hospital food has to be horrible? I mean, we are so uh, dealing with delicate people. We need to offer them very, very uh, gentle uh, taste sensation. And uh, often, the nutritional aspects are taken into priority compared to the uh, sensory experience of the food that we offer. So, going also beyond the five senses, what is the perception in general? Well, for example, uh, we have often sleep deprivation in the hospital because of noise, because of uh, bad smell, because of other things. That regards a typical aspect of a stress in the condition, and patients are interrupted at all hours for different medication, for cleaning the room, and so on and so on. Uh, the other thing is that patients lose the sense of time. Uh, often, when, especially in intensive care, daylight and night time are confused, and we're not providing the right sense of time to our patient. Remember, this may be a cause of stress, but at the same time, we may be losing some typical circadian uh, uh, functions that are typical of the hormonal activities and so on. So patients are under fear, uncertainty, sadness, pain, discomfort, loneliness, sleep deprivation. What can we do for them? Better sites. We should design better hospital architects. You should volunteer to go in hospital and tell people that don't see the handwriting on the walls and don't see the dirty or the scratched wall that they should improve this because patients need to have better color. They need to have uh, natural light. They have to have a better sight. This is a hospital nearby uh, that uh, has a garden inside. I'm sure that the garden could be improved further if somebody will take care of it. Uh, some other aspects related to visual arts in the hospital. Or the, the piece of art can be the hospital itself. The alleys can be areas. For example, I remember walking in the Mayo Clinic and the, at the entrance there is a beautiful mirror painting and so I thought it was a copy, it's a real one. Uh, this tells you a lot about uh, different funding that we may have. And in fact, uh, this is how we design our department. A little sculpture at the entrance. Uh, some historical uh, picture of what happened over the years. And we have the institute uh, with uh, 
specific nice collection of paintings. Some of them are copies, I must say, but uh, they are still very nice. And uh, we also ask students to perform in order to participate in a better site. And I can tell you, these things don't happen. You have to do it yourself. <laughs> I am sure that all these paintings are hanged up at the same height because I did it. You have to put yourself in play to make sure that this happens. Uh, we did design a museum inside the, the department, uh, and this is the museum. So somebody enters this and say, well, this is, yes, it's a place where they take care of me, but at least there is a better site. And some aspects related to the history may also help people spending time in a better uh, sense of, uh, of time. Again, our museum. This is the entrance. Colors, I think, are very important. Colors make life a little bit joyful. We have a special association of patients that are called Mondo dei Colori, a world of color. This was funded by a transplanted patient that said to me, when I was in dialysis, I was seeing life in black and white. When I was transplanted, I started to see life again in colors. The meeting room, oh, we have the, the, the children of our nurses, every year we do a special, uh, um, you know, a, a, a tournament to have the better drawing on, around the team and then we hang up all these things. Entertainment for patients, very important. Our dialysis patients are staying in bed, they get bored, so we need to entertain them. And uh, this is a, a special uh, bed station that Claudia Spies made in Berlin at the Charité with uh, a special uh, color changing on the, on the roof that uh, makes some type of chromotherapy, which has been uh, studied in detail by some people. Better sounds. You may go from what we call seeking the sound of silence. Simon and Garfunkel for the young people concert in Central Park a few decades ago. Uh, but the other thing can be is light pink noise, can be something that is very relaxing for the patient. We should strive to manage to eliminate the source of noise pollution and uh, encourage the people to take care of noise like a team. Everyone should be involved in this. Uh, there are studies. When you reduce sound and light exposure in patients, the conclusions say that simple measure to reduce intensive care unit patient sound light exposure appears effective. Effects of music during daytime rest in the intensive care unit. Impact of an active music therapy intervention on intensive care patient. Conclusion, the results of the study support active music therapy as a non-pharmacological intervention in intensive care. Better smells. Well, we have the opportunity to have a better air circulation if you design very well the, 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 the building and the environment. Or maybe diffusers with essential oils. I think that uh, ozone can also be used as a control for others. But we also have aromatherapy. We have precision medicine. Sometimes we can apply the better aroma for that specific patient. Better tactile feelings. I think weighted blankets, uh, windows open with pleasant breeze. Massage. Massage is very important. Uh, there are also uh, cryotherapy and thermal therapy that may help the patient. The sense of touch can be maximized with specific massage. Better taste. Hospitals should serve nice, fresh food. 
they should offer different kind of uh, probiotic foods that can help gut healing. In this sense, we did a book. It's in Italian. It, it says, the good cuisine for the health of your kidneys. And what we did, we hired uh, Michelin star chefs to create specific recipes with, within the limitations imposed by the dietary, uh, let's say, rules in, in kidney patients, but just to make these people not feel indifferent. They can have a good cuisine, even though they are sick. Better rest. We should create an environment where people may have a different kind of sensors, like when we put our, uh, uh, let's say, telephone on vibration, why not putting some alarms on vibration uh, directly on the, on the nurse or the doctor so that no noise may disturb the patient? Uh, specific natural lights should be also uh, provided and also provide a better sense of time to our patient. Uh, trying to reduce unnecessary rumination by improving communication and being more transparent uh, uh, at any given point in time. So, there are studies now going on on synesthesia. Five cents perspective to quality in hospital. There is a specific study going on in Italy uh, to study the effect of the application of what I meant to you and uh, different interventions that can actually be provided for the sense of smell, sound, touch, taste, and sight. And this is a protocol that is going to be tested because I'm sure that we have measurable, measurable outcomes but also unmeasurable outcomes. How can you measure if the patient is feeling slightly better or relieved very often these are not things that our administrator measure. They measure how many syringe or how many filters you used, not how happy is the patient. And also taking personal care and also spiritual aspects and interventions are included in the place. So just to conclude, medicine and architecture, I think, have in common symmetry, balance, and I hope that uh, I was able somehow to tell you that the balance we should search is between nature and science. This is our artificial kidney. This is our natural kidney. We have to balance the benefit and the what we call also the dark side of technology, as I meant before. Certainly, we have fantastic instruments and artificial intelligence helping us today to heal our patients. But the human touch of the physician still is important. Thank you very much.